Okie dokie. <laughs> right. So, I'll carry on with uh, my presentation. Very similar. <laughs> um, we're a junior company. We uh, live by forward-looking statements, so I'll be making some today. Um, I lifted this out of a publication that came out last week. And uh, let me see. Okay. Um, I didn't put that in there. The publication did. You see there's a gap here. Where to look for copper, gold, and porphyries. And I don't think they even knew that we existed, but guess where we are? We're right in that gap. And this is a belt of porphyries that extends all the way from here in Chile, all the way up through Peru, up into Colombia, and eventually up into Panama over here. And one arm actually goes into Venezuela here. But this is a very, very conspicuous gap. Why is that gap there? For political reasons. It's because that nobody has looked before. It's not because there's nothing there. It's because nobody's actually looked. So, uh, discovery is filling the gap. Of course, uh, Richard alluded to this, and we all know about Seoul Gold and Lundin Gold down here, but this is where we're sitting, over here. And, of course, everyone's aware that the majors are very much in, in back in country. You know, I get asked all the time by people, especially uh, those who uh, are not, uh, not too fully acquainted with Ecuador, what's the political risk? What's the political risk? Well, you know, you've got companies like these guys here, like Newcrest. Anglo-Americans got a, 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 a joint venture with Ross Beatty. Uh, Glencore is in the country, Fortescue Mining's there, Hancock Prospecting with Gina Reinhardt's company. I don't think there is political risk anymore. I think, uh, I think the, most of the risk now is going to be geological risk, operational risk. And um, I think the biggest risk, though, is, is dealing with communities. And that's why we're making such a huge effort uh, with our co corporate social responsibility team. So this is where we are again, over here where the pink dot is. This is the Cordillera del Cudicu, the Cordillera del Condor down here, which has been heavily looked at um, historically. There is a river here called the Santiago River. It's the only river that actually flows from the west to the east and down into the Amazon Basin here. And it occupies a, a fairly deep canyon. And because of that, Really, the infrastructure which was built out starting down here ended there, and not much happened up here. And this area has not received a lot of exploration. Now, you see a lot of orange here. This is very significant to the story. The orange is basement. It's granite basement. So it's uh, really the roots of the, of the belt in here. And you see these little remnants of purple and blue on top of it. And these are volcanics and sediments. And it's pretty ratty through here because it's been heavily eroded. So there's only little scabs of this stuff on top of the granite now. Um, the gold deposits, typically the epithermal deposits, are occurring with volcanic rock. These types of rocks in here. You can see Nambiha is over here. Ferdinand del Norte is in... Uh, the similar sort of a, a, a piece of rock, uh, belt of rocks over in here. And, but there were probably many, many, many other epithermal deposits that were in here, which are completely gone now. And what's been left behind is the gold, because gold is indestructible. The, the, uh, the quartz veins have largely eroded away. It's gone right down to the, the roots, the erosion. And so there's, been, there's a lot of gold in this area in alluvials, a lot of placer gold, and that's what attracted the, um, the prospectors into this area starting really around the 1920s. And so this area has been heavily explored uh, in comparison to up here uh, because companies have been trying to trace back where that uh, alluvial gold's been coming from. So lots and lots of work done in this area. There's been approximately 20, 2020 porphyry copper type deposits found in here. Um, now, uh, they're all of various grades. 
some of them are a little bit too low grade to, to uh, be a go uh, right at this moment, but maybe uh, in the future at some time they, they will be of interest. Of course, Mirador here, uh, as uh, Richard was saying, is in pre-production by the Chinese. Fruta del Norte is here. Fruta del Norte actually has two porphyry coppers on either side of it that were discovered by my group, but we, we never really got a, a kick at the can at them. Um, now, the geological belt rips right up through here. And, you know, you don't have to be really a geologist or an exploration manager to figure out, gosh, you know, this area up here is probably very, very prospective. In fact, I would say it's a no-brainer. Um, and it amazes me that we were af actually able to pick this land up and, uh, and be the very first uh, people, first mover status in this area. The last people who were in here, 1966, 1969, Shell Oil were investigating some oil seeps in here. And then prior to that, we're looking way, way back to the age of the Spanish conquistadors, but never a mining company into this area. So what we're seeing here, though, is that uh, things like epithermal deposits, we're finding the very tops of them. So the sinters, the hot springs, the geysers, things like that, are preserved in this area because this area has not had a lot of erosion. It's quite possible as well that down here there was, uh, there was uh, copper um, uh, in sediments as well, but it's completely eroded away. Over here, maybe there's some copper in sediments, but this is National Park on the Peruvian side of the border. The border comes down, snakes down through like here, through here. So we've got the bulk of this area in here tied up. It's all in red here. Um, for those who don't understand hectares, this is more than half a million acres, 208,000 hectares. It's a beautiful, beautiful, contiguous block, block of ground and extremely prospective, as we've been finding out. So uh, this came out of the Northern Miner a couple years ago, and this was the original premise for getting into this area. And uh, it was all really the responsibility uh, of this gentleman, Octavio Latore, uh, a uh, professor of history who I met in 1998. And he had had a very interesting life. Uh, unfortunately, he's no longer with us. Um, but uh, when I met him in 1998, he said, uh, Keith, I'm very, very interested in what you do because I've actually worked for the mines department myself. And I said, how is that even possible? You're a, a historian. And he said, well, in 1981, there was a place in Ecuador called Nambija that was actually a mine of the Spanish conquistadors. And it had been abandoned in 1603 after an, um, an epidemic of smallpox had killed the labor force. They were using indigenous people as labor. So the Spaniards just simply walked away. And it was reclaimed by the jungle and lost. And um, it was rediscovered in 1981. This is highly documented. It's not just uh, something out of Treasure Island. It uh, actually happened. Uh, it's found by two boys hunting wild pigs in the forest. They told their father, and within uh, one month, there were 25,000 miners there. And 75 mining operations working underground. And on the record, it produced, in the modern era, 2.7 million ounces of gold. So, and that's pretty damn significant. It was very, very high grade. In fact, there's over a thousand people still there on site. So what happened though, at the time there was no national mining law and people just rushed in. Uh, it was a massive land grab. And the government said, look, we know that there are other places like this that are lost Spanish mines. And what we want to do is secure them and then vend the rights to companies like Homestake or Placer or, or who, whoever at the time. And so um, he was hired by the government to go through the archives in Ecuador looking for mentions of lost mines. And he found hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of documents working over the course of two years. And um, so when I met him, he was very fired up because he said to me, Keith, you know, there had been seven seven famous gold mines in Ecuador, five have been recovered over time, and two of them are still lost. And the two that are still lost are Logroño de los Caballeros and Sevilla de Oro, and they were regarded by contemporary authors to be the richest places in the Spanish Empire. 
not just the richest places here, but the richest places anywhere in the Spanish holdings, including places like the Philippines. So this is incredibly important. Um, and, uh, and the professor showed me uh, maps, and uh, I actually have this map sitting on the wall of my office here in Toronto. It's from 1584, and uh, I'll show you a, a, a kind of a, a blow-up of that in a second or two. So what happened? And, and uh, it took a few years for me to actually rid myself of what I was doing at the time in South Africa, and then I went back to Ecuador in 2000 and uh, vowed to the, uh, the professor that we were going to start a new company and, and go look for these things. Um, and uh, we started the work in January of 2001, uh, but actually it took, uh, it took a bit of a left turn uh, and not in a bad way because um, I found a, a breccia pipe uh, within the first month of, of doing uh, reconnaissance field work uh, but not in a place where we actually uh, believe that the lost cities may occur. And then eventually that, um, that breccia pipe discovery, I acquired 400 hectares of land. I grew it out to actually 96,000 hectares, a very, very big piece of ground, and then explored it over the course of, of the following years. And then in 2006 came up with this. And whoops. So, you know, this is what happened the last time, <laughs> the last time. Um, we went from 36, 30 cents to $40, 10,000%. Uh, it was a beautiful run. Uh, we hit a, a deposit of 13.7 million ounces of gold and 56 million ounces of silver. And then it was sold to Kenross, and that was it, the end of it. So there I am looking like a proud papa at 12 boxes of visible gold, and I really hope that I get the chance to do that with my own discovery uh, again, or our own discovery, I, I should uh, add. It's very, very gratifying to be able to go back and see something which is just about to go into production. And this is one of the twin declines uh, today. This is just taken about a month ago uh, at, uh, at London Gold's operation. So they're already underground. Uh, they're actually uh, stockpiling ore because the mill's not ready yet. Uh, the mill's about 80% complete. Uh, they'll be mining between 300,000 and, uh, uh, 300, and 350,000 ounces of gold per year uh, for the next 15 years, starting in September, October, and uh, at a cash cost of under $600 US an ounce. So an incredible win. Um, a nice, uh, it's going to be about 3.5% of the GDP of the country. Very, very important discovery. So getting back to the lost cities, this is Sevilla de Oro here. This is the Groño de los Caballeros. The, the, um, the legend on this uh, map, it says Peruvia Rifere Regionis Typus. This is Latin, which means the gold areas of Peru. And there's all kinds of little cities through here because the Spanish actually didn't um, designate or didn't uh, differentiate between three different types of gold. The, the gold that they stole from the Incas, the gold that they robbed from, uh, from tombs, which they called Huacaro gold, or uh, gold that they actually mined out of the ground. So a lot of these settlements here were actually Inca villages that they raided. And it's a very, very unfortunate and sad piece of history. But, uh, but there you go. Uh, Sevilla de Oro and Logroño, from the uh, evidence we have from the documents, uh, these were discoveries that were made by the Spaniards themselves. They were not made previously by the Inca. In fact, the Inca never had a presence in this part of, of uh, the countryside. Uh, it's a little bit hard to read this, but this is a document from 1628 that I found in the Vatican. A couple of things to point out here, and I haven't done this in a presentation previously, but um, it's talking about Sevilla de Oro. You could just make it out here, Sevilla de Oro. How to get to Sevilla de Oro from the town of Riobamba, following the Rio de Chambo, the uh, Chambo River. It talks about uh, going through the mountains and finding two lakes, Dos Lagunas Muy Grandes, Dos Lagunas Muy Grandes, and it gives a description here. It talks about the destruction of Logroño de los Caballeros, 
um, by an uprising of, of the, uh, the native people. And, uh, and um, it says here, uh, maybe the most interesting part, part for uh, exploration people, la tierra más rica de oro que hay en todas las Indias. The earth is richer in gold than all of the Indies. Uh, and this sounds like it might have been wrote, written by a, a mining promoter, but I assure you it was not. It was written by a, a Carmelite priest in 1628. Uh, Real Bamba, this is where the trail, what I call the Conquistador Trail, starts. Uh, this is called the Bar Barbanata Church. It's the oldest church in uh, Ecuador. It was built in 1534. Uh, it's been um, rebuilt. It was actually knocked down flat in 1800 by an earthquake and then rebuilt back on the site exactly the way it was. But uh, you can see there's cracks in the pillars here and, and such. Um, but here it is in a document from 1615 to 1616, right in the center of Real Bamba. Uh, Real Bamba, um, the, the new town has moved four kilometers away in a, an area that they thought was uh, less prone to earthquakes. Um, but the, the church is actually still in the same place. And this church was built by the, um, by the conquistador uh, Allegro uh, de Almagra. And um, it, uh, it was the last civilized place along the road going to the east. So this is uh, the conquistadors all would have stopped here and, and worshipped and, uh, and, uh, and um, uh, prayed to God that their, uh, their, uh, uh, their expedition was going to be successful. And then off they went into the unknown. Uh, it's a pretty scary thing, probably, you know, when you think about it. Um, now, you, those in the back won't be able to read this, but this is the Rio Chambo here. And this is from Google Images, so this... These are the two lakes that they're talking about, the two Dos Lagunas, Lagas, two large lakes. And this is the, uh, the present highway which goes from, um, from Real Bamba, which is up here, uh, to Macas. So um, they've followed the same route that the conquistadors followed. This would have been a donkey trail many, many, many years ago, going right past, over the height of land, right past over the... Uh, past the lakes, and then down into the valley and towards uh, where Macus is now. Um, I've had one critic on the internet who uh, has called the, um, uh, what we're trying to do here uh, uh, a silly search for El Dorado. The guy's an idiot. Um, this is not uh, fantasy land. This is real. And there were real people who lived and died in these places, and they're commemorated. And we have uh, the documents, some of which are actually signed by these people. Uh, this is a, a, a statue uh, which commemorates uh, the founder of Logroño and the founder of Sevilla de Oro, uh, Juan de Salinas Loyola. And uh, he was a conquistador who uh, died in the town of Loja in, uh, in uh, 1592 at the age of 90. And uh, he's commemorated here by a, a statue uh, in the heart of the city. Now, uh, I was in Loja just uh, about a month ago. And uh, I hadn't been there for a number of years. And I, I, um, I stopped at the Casa de Cultura, the, uh, the museum. And uh, I asked the curator there if she knew uh, where Juan de Salinas is buried, because he's supposedly buried somewhere in the city. So she said she didn't know, and she said, I do know somebody who does know, so I'm going to find out. And so she got on the phone, and she found this gentleman in Cuenca, at the age of 74, a retired historian. He said, oh, yes, he's buried in the, in the, uh, in the Dominican church in Loja. And I said, well, how is that possible? Because that church only dates from the 1860s, and he died in, in the 1590s. And he said, well, you know, the church actually was rebuilt on the site of the old church. Uh, the spires here are actually the only part of the old church which still survives. They're Gothic. But the rest of the church collapsed and was knocked down in an earthquake. And our boy, Wanda Salinas, is down in the crypt. 
So he's underneath the church, down in the sub-sub-basement, uh, in a fairly ornate tomb. And um, so I, I asked the historian, I said, have you seen this tomb? He says, yes. He says, and there's an inscription on the side of it. And I said, what does the inscription say? He says, I can't remember. <laughs> and I, I'm really, really intrigued to, um, you know, I hate going down into the crypt, but I'm really intrigued to find out to see if there's any kind of a, some sort of a clue as to where the lost cities might be. And uh, now, uh, just uh, recently, uh, about a, a month or two ago, we had a call out of the blue from a gentleman representing Discovery Channel. And uh, we've already had uh, Vice News to the property. We've had Bloomberg to the property. Uh, this guy wants to come and do, uh, they have the most popular TV show on, on Discovery Channel at the present. It's called Expedition Unknown. And they want to come and do a, a one-hour documentary on us. And I told him, I said, you know, Wanda Salinas's tomb is down in the, in the crypt of this. And he said, can we get down there to film? <laughs> I said, well, don't get ahead of yourself here. I said, I have no idea, but we're going to have to see if we can uh, uh, talk to the Catholic Church and uh, maybe uh, uh, get, uh, get uh, some permission to go and look. So, um, as Richard so rightly pointed out, uh, we work very, very carefully, very closely with the communities in our area. Um, it is, uh, in my opinion, it's the easiest way for a project to go sideways uh, in Ecuador. And, um, you know, I, when I started my career, I worked with guys who had, uh, you know, started out in the 30s and the 40s. And uh, they said to me, ah, you know, just ignore the local people and, and uh, don't even wave to them when you drive past them and that kind of stuff. And, and that doesn't, that just doesn't work anymore. And in fact, it never did work. Uh, it just uh, alienated, uh, um, uh, alienated people and, uh, and got rocks thrown at you. Um, so uh, we have a, um, signed agreements with many of the villages, um, but uh, there are only certain things that uh, an exploration company like us can do. We don't have all the money in the world, and there's a certain, there's an obvious need amongst these um, indigenous villages. They are very, very poor. And, uh, and I saw a, a need. Um, uh, not only does it provide social license for us to operate, but it's the right thing to do. So I, uh, I set up a private foundation. It's called the Step Forward Foundation. And uh, we've been doing uh, things in tandem with the company uh, and things that uh, really are out of the company purview. Um, to, uh, to, to help the local people. Um, this is my, my brother, who's a, a pediatric oncologist here at SickKids, and uh, he's taking some measurements from the local kids uh, for uh, circumference of their skull and their height and their weight. And uh, we did this in a number of villages. Uh, we also employed a, a local doctor and a local nurse to take uh, blood samples uh, of all the children in one village. We had permission to do that from the headman of the village and, and from the parents. And um, what we found was that there were uh, a, a number of, of children who had anemia. Um, it wasn't so bad, but, uh, you know, it's, um, it is something that uh, uh, we, we um, didn't expect. Um, my sister here, uh, Angela Cuddy, is a, a clinic clinical nutritionist, so she came down to help us out. This is Monica Espina, the head of our corporate social responsibility team. And I don't know if she's here. No, she's not here today. But uh, we interviewed uh, all the, uh, the women in the village uh, about specifically about the diet um, for the families and, and the children. And we were horrified to find out that, on average, the children are getting two meals of protein a week. A week, and this is their breakfast, lunch, and dinner: cassava root and plantain, starch. It's just like the Irish. What happened with the Irish potato famine? The, the people in Ireland eating potatoes bre uh, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner all the time, and, and getting things like rickets and, and uh, vitamin deficiencies. 
And this is, here's the problem here. This little girl here is uh, standing on a bucket so she can see over the windowsill. When we took the measurements and we graphed them all up, we found that all the children, all of the children were underweight and undersized for their age. And that's a consequence of their diet. And because they're not getting the protein to build their bodies properly. It's a very, very sad thing. And this was not just in one village, this was in three villages where we tested. Now, Richard has talked about Sacha Inchi. This is a, a, a plant that is indigenous to the area, uh, and it grows as a vine. And uh, for hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of years, uh, the local people would harvest this. And uh, this was a great source of protein for them. But this, is, this collective memory has kind of been lost. And, you know, of course, uh, if you give them a bag of chips, they'd rather eat a bag of chips. Um, and they don't have to go into the jungle and harvest it. Uh, but uh, uh, this is an exceptional uh, find on, on our part. And uh, it's something that I think really might make a big, big change here. So this is what it looks like when it's, it's harvested. It's in a husk that has to be removed. And then you get the nut here. And my sister was at a trade show, and she saw this Inca snacks. This is coming from Peru. So they're actually, uh, there is no one in Ecuador right now who's harving, harvesting this stuff and sending it elsewhere. Um, but um, this is what they're doing here. And as Richard said, in this case, they've done an analysis and come up with 31% protein, which is a huge number. It's like beefsteak. It's incredible. And then all the omega-3, omega-6, omega-9, they're all in here. Fiber is in here. Uh, it's, it, it really is a superfood. And so this is Producto Peruano. It's coming from Peru just across the border from Ecuador. And they're harvesting this stuff and sending it overseas uh, to Canada and, and to the U.S. I, I, think, um, I think she saw this in the U.S. Uh, she, she got a, a little uh, um, bag of it. But um, the thing is, I mean, the, the children don't have to eat it. I mean, you could, you could grow incredible amounts of this stuff. It, it, it grows actually like a weed. And harvest it and give it to pigs and put weight on the pigs. Um, there's, you could give it to chickens. I mean, there's a, a million and one uses for this thing. So um, we've been setting up, we set up an experimental farm here. Uh, not only do we raise Sacha Inchi in here, but we're also uh, raising our plants to do our, deforest, our, our reforestation of uh, our drill pads when we do the uh, reclamation. So this is what Sacha Inchi is. And you can see this is just emerging from the seeds right here. And then we, um, we put these plants in the, in the local, uh, uh, some little experimental farms around the area. This is just, it's very, very early days, but uh, potentially this is something that's really going to turn around things. Now, how do I do this? Whoops. Okay, we don't have any, any sound. But um, this is um, the, uh, very recently we did, no, don't worry about it. Sure. Yeah, yeah. We did a ribbon cutting ceremony for um, uh, the uh, clinic of Piancas. Uh, in Piancas, it's going to service five villages. Um, before that, they had a, a, a humble little, uh, building where there were three doctors crammed in and all the, the medical instruments were piled in the corner. Uh, not a very nice thing, um, but uh, this was done uh, with the company and uh, working together with the foundation. Whoops. Um, and the, the, the local folks had a, uh, um, a celebration, a welcoming ceremony for us. Uh, we were very, very um, happy to uh, be received so very well. And then uh, I uh, got this uh, very uh, impressive uh, present um, from the uh, local uh, school teacher who um, wanted to thank me on behalf of the community. And I've actually got it here. <laughs> and uh, 
it took somebody about a week to make, but it's supposed to be only for um, chiefs of the uh, caciques of the uh, indigenous people. So I was very, very happy to receive this, and, and this is, I'm going to keep this forever. This is really, really something special. Um, so, uh, okay, now you're all here for exploration results and what we're doing and the potential and all the rest of it. And, uh, you know, some people consider what I just presented here fluff. Uh, I think it's very, very important. And I think it's very important that you, you saw uh, what's, uh, what's happening here. Now, we don't have any sound on this either, but again, uh, the conditions under uh, how these guys are doing the work is, uh, it's difficult. Uh, they call it the green inferno, the inferno verde. Uh, it's difficult terrain. There's not a lot of access. Most of the time you're crawling your way through the jungle or you're cutting your way with a machete. And uh, you can see that we've managed to make it work. We've, uh, we've successfully drilled uh, one of our targets and we'll be moving on to uh, another target very shortly, Yaoi. And, um, but uh, essentially, we are the very first people into a virgin area and we're making it work. And I think, uh, you know, I take my hat off to Richard and the, the technical people and the team and the CSR people, all hand in hand, they, they've made this work. And uh, I think we're right on the cusp, right on the verge of making a major discovery. So um, you're all familiar with the work that we've been doing, a lot of stream sediment sampling um, throughout the whole property. Uh, as a very first pass, we did a magnetic and radiometric survey. Um, you can see uh, the stinger out in the front of the helicopter. This is the magnetic sensor. And we got a bunch of porphyry copper type targets as a result of that magnetic flying. And then eventually, uh, we narrowed uh, down the search to one target area that we called Crunchy Hill, and we drilled nine holes in it. And stream sediment sampling, um, it's important to note again that where we are in uh, geologically, we're up in very, very high level where the hot springs would be, geysers, those kind of deposits. We're not down into the guts of the thing where it's been deeply eroded. So we're looking not just for gold, but looking for what are called pathfinder elements, things that occur with gold, um, but uh, they'll often signify that there's gold at depth. So things in uh, enrichments of things like arsenic and antimony and mercury and thallium and selenium. And you see them all here. And wherever you have the big red dots, where we're having concentrations of this stuff, and you can see patterns, of course, and stuff here, like Latore East. There's a concentration of arsenic here, and antimony, and silver, and selenium, and moly. There's no thallium in this case, but that doesn't matter. What that means is that there's a bedrock source for these stream sediments very, very, very close. And when the geologists go and investigate this, it's usually a case of just going upstream, and cutting the foliage away with a machete over a course of maybe a half hour sometimes, and, and there it is, they find something outcropping on the surface, some, some altered materials, some pyrite, uh, some silicification, whatever. Uh, this is going back, this is a long time, ancient history, 2006. This is not our property, but this is the old Aurelian property, and just to show you how we found Fruta del Norte, because Fruta del Norte had no gold on surface. None. It had an arsenic, antimony, and mercury uh, anomaly on surface here, just like we're finding. And now we got 17 of these things. And we drilled it. Um, so, oh, I just put, put this in. This is Crunchy Hill, what we had here. Arsenic, antimony, mercury, and a whole bunch of other things as well. Uh, we found an epithermal system here. Probably the gold zone is at depth a little bit deeper than we drilled. Uh, but, you know, we'd like to get some ha uh, low-hanging fruit here rather than blowing our brains out on this one target because we've got 17 of these things and still growing. Uh, and, uh, gosh, I would love to find another uh, potential Fruta del Norte uh, on first, second, third hole uh, rather than hole number 55. 
So um, that's one of the reasons why we're moving on to new target now, uh, Yowie. But this is going back, of course, to the Fruit del Norte discovery. We drilled right under the arsenic antimony and mercury anomaly, and we hit 237 meters of 4 grams. Not at the surface, nothing at the surface, no gold. So it's buried, it's what we call a blind discovery. It was found by geochemistry. This is a sample uh, that was just found a couple of weeks ago from a brand new location up in the northern part of the project. Uh, and it's uh, chalcedonic quartz, it's full of pyrite, and it's another epithermal. So uh, maybe this is number 18. Uh, but what I, I want to say here is that there's a lot of joy here. We've only explored 50% of it. <coughs> and there's going to be a lot more coming out of this. So I want to move on to something which I think is, is the most important thing that we've found to date. The sedimentary hosted copper silver mineralization. And green is now my favorite color. Here it is. Um, it's just lovely, lovely stuff. Uh, the geologists started to find this back in October. The black here is a mineral called tenorite, which is copper oxide. The green is malachite, copper carbonate, and it's in sediments, and it's in fine grain, like a siltstone here. This is actually native copper in the red here, and you can see the, the, end, the, the business end of a, a, a rock hammer here. But this is what it commonly looks like. Uh, malachite, uh, chrysocolla, both copper minerals on the surface. And these are running pretty nice grades. Um, and we're finding it over a considerable distance, 22 kilometers. 22 kilometers. Now, what I'm, not, I'm saying is that it's not like we found it here, and we found it here, and there's 22 kilometers between them, because we've got now we've got uh, 60, 70, 80 samples now spread out. I mean, they're occurring every couple of hundred meters uh, where you've got exposure or where they're finding uh, float blocks. But, but look at the numbers here. These numbers are astounding. 5% copper, 4% copper, 7% copper, 9% copper, and always with appreciable silver. 45 grams. 185 grams, 24 grams, 28 grams, 20 grams, 19 grams. And this is very important here. These things. Now, by analogy with what is going on to the south, and remember, I worked on a property of 96,000 hectares on the, port, on the, the property. Uh, it's 100 k's south of here, but it's in the same belt. When we found... Um, magnetic anomalies like this, they turned out to be copper porphyries. And certainly, soul gold looks like this as well. Uh, it's either one big porphyry, but probably, more probable, it's a cluster of porphyries because we flew the airborne survey. It's very coarse, only 400 meters, 400 meters between the lines, so it's not very good resolution. Um, but the whole area here is covered in sediments a blanket of sediments lying on top of the porphyries as well. And then all these green triangles are where we've been finding the copper. And the important thing is the scale bar here, three kilometers. So this is more than 20 k's north-south. It's an incredible distance. I have never seen anything like this. And uh, I got interviewed uh, yesterday um, on uh, a, a internet broadcast, and I said to the gentleman, the last time anybody saw uh, copper like this, uh, 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 sedimentary hosted copper that was oxide copper, over a distance like this was when Leopold II uh, owned the Belgian Congo. So we're talking 1910. And I'll tell you, if this st stuff, stuff like this had been found anywhere in the world, except maybe Afghanistan, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 30 years ago, it would be gone. Stuff like this, you can't find anymore. Maybe you have to go to Mar Mars or somewhere. Are those samples all on surface? All of them. All of them, yeah. We have not drilled yet. So here's, um, this is another um, 
Okay, going back. So we're looking. Just a sec, we're looking at this northern area here, and it's just more and more samples. And you see lots and lots of healthy numbers here, and we haven't cherry picked here. So what you see is what you get. Lots and lots of high copper numbers, lots and lots of nice silver numbers, always a couple of ounces per ton silver. Beautiful looking stuff. This is a southern area again, and again, we got lots and lots of nice copper numbers, silver numbers, etc., etc., etc. Now, won't it be fun to drill this? This is going to be so much fun because nobody has drilled anything like this for a long, long time. So we got a strike length here of 22 kilometers, a width on surface up to an excess of one kilometer, um, high grade copper and silver. What it compares with geologically, now I'm not gonna say that it's exactly the same because we don't know yet, we haven't drilled it, we haven't found the ends of this thing. Uh, we know that it's at least 22 Ks, but what it most resembles geologically is the Central African Copper Belt down here and the Kufferschiefer, which is German word for copper shale, in uh, the former East Germany and in the Poland here. Now, you may not have heard too much about the Kufferschiefer because um, the company that's mining it now is the Polish National Mining Company, and they're only listed in Warsaw. But they are number eight copper producer in the whole world. They're number six silver producer in the whole world, and it's coming from the Kufferschiefer. On the German side, on the German side, mining stopped in 1990 as a result of reunification, but it had gone on for 800 years. In fact, the earliest mention that we have on paper is from 1199, a, a book that's written in high German. And before that, though, there's evidence of, of, of Bronze Age workings. So it goes back a hell of a long way. Now, there are components that you see in the Kufferschiefer today, and the Kufferschiefer is a lot younger than the, the, the copper belt in, in, uh, in Africa. So uh, I'm making uh, direct comparisons here. We see uh, marine uh, invertebrates. Uh, this is an ammonite, so this would have been like a nautilus, uh, a squid living in a big shell. Uh, it's approximately this size, and we find these all over the place. So uh, in the Kurduku at one time, it was a shallow sea. We find stuff like this. The geologists pick up pieces of selenite gypsum. And also, uh, this is a present that I was given by the Schwar. Uh, all wrapped up in a banana leaf, and it was a big, big chunk of salt. And there are three places within the Kurdukou where there are salt brines coming out of the ground, and they're so salty that all they have to do is <coughs> put the stuff in a basin over a fire and, and leave it for a, a half hour or so, and they end up with a big, uh, chunky piece of salt. Uh, it's a high honor to receive a gift of salt from the, the, uh, the Schwar. Uh, it was their only trade good. Uh, they never ever bothered with gold or silver or anything like that. This was much more value to them because everyone needs salt for life. Petrified wood. There's lots and lots of petrified wood in the Kurdukou. So lots of carbon. This is important for the story because carbon is the precipitating agent in the sediments that's causing the copper to come out of solution and form copper minerals. So what we've got here, we've got plant and stem fragments. And this would have been deposited in a, a shallow sea that uh, was anoxic. At the bottom of the sea, there was no free oxygen. Similar sort of thing today in the Baltic. Uh, in the Baltic right now, uh, a couple of years ago, the um, National Geographic Society sent down some rover subs. They found some Roman ships with wooden planking still intact. And the reason for that is because there's no bacteria and there's no oxygen down there to eat the stuff up. So it survives. Um, over geological time, there's been many, many things like this. 
they end up, all the, the carbonaceous material sinks to the bottom. You know, if this was in High Park here in Toronto, uh, uh, leaf fragments, they would have disintegrated within a couple of weeks or so. Uh, but this uh, settled down through the water column into the black shale and then was, uh, was preserved. Um, in extreme examples, uh, you would get coal beds. Um, or you could get uh, oil form, uh, forming from uh, critters like this. But um, look at these values, though. Look at this. 6.3% copper, 48 grams per ton silver. And people say to me, Keith, are you changing religion here, going from gold to copper? And, you know, uh, Robert Friedland, when he was looking for diamonds in Labrador, found Voises Bay. And that was about 30 years ago. And they sold for uh, Voices Bay for 4.3 billion bucks to Inco. Um, you know, we've been looking for porphyry copper. We've been looking for gold. And we found sedimentary copper. You know, if God gives you a kiss on the forehead and gives you a present, you don't uh, say, uh, hey, I don't want that. I'm giving it back. Uh, this is an incredible thing that we found here. And in terms of gold equivalent, it's 9.5 grams per ton gold equivalent. Now, I'm not saying all the grades are going to be like this. But this is significant, and you got to pay attention to it. This is a big sample. This is actually a, a double long um, hammer. It's about yay big. And when you cracked it open, you can see the layers in here, the black layers of carbon together with um, copper oxide. And this is running 3.6% copper, 104 grams per ton gold, or silver rather, gross metal value uh, as of last night, 263 uh, U.S. dollars per ton. This is where the Kufer Schiefer formed what's called the Zechstein Basin. It was an inland sea like the Caspian or like the Baltic. Um, it stretched all the way from Scotland over here, all the way to just on the tip of, of Russia over here, Belarus, and the thing was mineralized the whole way. Not economically mineralized the whole way, but along the southern extent here, uh, very much so. And these are where the mines were. So here's Frankfurt over here, here's Stuttgart, Dresden over here, Leipzig, here's the Polish border. Lots and lots and lots of mines operated through this area starting, as I said, 800 years ago. This is 600 kilometers across here, 600 kilometers, and then these are the active mines uh, right now being mined by K KGHM. This is, this is essentially what it is. So the, on the German side, it outcropped here, and it dipped fairly steeply. It's this little black layer here. This is the Kufer Schiefer. And down here in Poland, it's around 1,000, 1,200 meters deep, but still economic to mine. So they're underground. They're down here. They're mining it by shafts. Um, on top of the Kufer Schiefer, there are evaporites. Evaporites, a, fa uh, a fancy name for salt and gypsum deposits. And salt is a very, very important part of this whole thing. And we see, of course, salt in the Kurdaku. And then underneath all this is what's called the Rodligendes. Uh, and these are red beds, red rocks. And these are also very important. So what you have geologically, and I don't want to scare anyone because this is kind of high school chemistry, but you have copper-rich brines, so this is copper chloride, which is moving through the groundwater, and it will move and maybe may go for very, very long distance, distances until it comes in contact with carbon-bearing rock, the Kufer Schiefer, and then that carbon gets knocked out, uh, that copper gets knocked out of solution and forms uh, copper ore. So it's mainly in the Kufer Schiefer, but it can be down into the underlying or the overlying uh, beds. And uh, just very, very quickly, uh, the economic th thickness is above 0.8 meters on Poland. It goes 0.4 meters to 26 meters in thickness. The grades are similar to what we've been getting through our sampling, 40 to 60 grams per ton silver, 1.6 to 2.2 weight percent of copper. That's why I really you know, this is very, very interesting for me. Uh, this is a, um, 
uh, in, a in one of the national parks in Germany, uh, an exposure of the Kufferschiefer. Um, the Rutligendes, the red beds here, you can see this reddish rock in here. The Kufferschiefer is actually a very, very, very thin layer in here below limestones, which are sitting up in here. And here's the thin layer. And the reason this is still here and it hasn't been mined out by anyone is because it's only 10 centimeters thick and it doesn't represent ore. It's too skinny and narrow and nobody messed around with it. Uh, this is uh, not too far away though when they did, where they did uh, mine it back in the 1870s at uh, a mine called the Langevin mine in Nordhausen. And uh, the Kufer sheaf was sitting in here. It's all rubble because they extracted it on surface and backfilled it. But you can see it underground here, and they've labeled it. This is now a museum mine. The Kufer sheaf is in here, and then the red rocks are underneath here, and carbonate, zechstein calc on, on top of it. 300 kilometers away, 300 kilometers away in Poland and Lubin. This is the Kufer Schiefer underground here, and this is the Rodligendes, the red rocks underneath down in here, and so this is uh, more or less a semi-continuous band a layer of rocks. It's like it's like the coal formations in Wyoming, for God's sake. They go on forever, 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 forever. It doesn't mean that they're ore the whole way, because the grade is going to vary along the strike. And the thickness is going to vary. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping and praying that we found something like this. I'm not saying we have yet. We have a lot of work to do, a lot of exploration to do, a lot of geological mapping to do. But we have all the elements. We have the salt. We have the black shale. We have the red beds beneath the black shale in the coup de coup. And we have a real great shot at finding something. We've already found this thing across 22 kilometers. So this is uh, pretty much my end here. This is Le Grogno, uh, the, the, uh, the professor and myself and my assistant back in 2008. Uh, this is not the Le Grogno that we're looking for. This is actually uh, a new settlement that was established around the time of, of uh, the First World War. Um, so it's not too far away, and it was named after the, the original, but uh, we're certainly on the hunt, and we're getting closer every day. So thank you very much. The bar is open, and if you have any questions, you can ask me over there. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much for coming.